Thank you and welcome everyone to the second annual Ted Rose Lecture Series. I'm Robin Muhammad and I'm Associate Professor of History in the Department of African American Studies. We come together again this evening to honor and carry on the work of the late Professor Ted Rose. His commitment to students, the community, and the Department of African American Studies are well known and we are standing on the shoulders of giants. This evening, our guest speaker, Professor Cedric Johnson of the University of Illinois Chicago in the Departments of Black Studies and Political Science, has produced a long line of scholarship and is a frequent contributor to several platforms of critical, academic, and popular commentary. Tonight, Professor Johnson's talk, The Power of Black Lives Matter, American Liberalism and Inequality After George Floyd, promised promises to continue his distinguished and enriching line of investigation and inspiration. I believe his scholarship is at the intersection of studying cityscapes, political terrain, and multiple racial, class, and gendered identities. His latest work, The Panthers Can't Save Us Now, Debating Left Politics and Black Lives Matter, offers up a colloquium of the debates, the discussion, and the deliberations that have been resonating with us for several years and promise to be with us for many years to come. And we're very grateful that Professor Johnson is here tonight to expand on those ideas and to engage with the community about what's going on now and what could happen in the future. Please join me in welcoming Professor Johnson, and please stay for the Q&A that will follow. Professor Johnson, welcome. All right, thank you so much, uh, Robin, for the introduction. I really appreciate the kind words. I also want to thank uh, uh, Bayina Jeffries, Daniel Moak, and everyone else who contributed to organizing this year's uh, Ted Rose uh, lecture. I also want to say that I'm incredibly flattered, not just knowing, you know, how important um, he was to the making of African American studies at Ohio University, but also knowing that I'm following behind uh, two people whose work I've read and respected for so long. Uh, my fellow um, University of Maryland alum, Derek White, uh, who was a speaker before, as well as my good comrade, Ture Reed. So it's a lot of pressure to have to fill this spot and follow behind some of these other these are the guys, but um, we'll see how it goes. I, um, what I want to do today um, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so is I want to invite everybody to wrestle alongside me with the contradictions of um, Black Lives Matter as an important historical phenomenon of the last decade. And what I'm going to do is try to go carefully and methodically through a criticism that's taken shape in a number of things that I've written. And it's a criticism of the liberal character of Black Lives Matter and how that liberal character has been responsible for tremendous levels of, of uh, mobilization. And yet at the same time, misses the mark in terms of confronting the real problem that's in front of us and what underlies the problem of mass incarceration and um, you know carceral power, maybe more precisely in our times. And so that's what I'm going to do by sketching out this argument. Hopefully people have good uh, questions and, and thoughts on it. We can have a, a good conversation to follow. So in less than a decade, Black Lives Matter has evolved from a hashtag slogan into a broad banner for any carceral and any racist forces throughout the United States and around the world. And in the wake of the police uh, murder of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter demonstrations produced a tidal wave of local and state legislation. We should really be on guard of anyone who says that nothing's happened since 2020. They would be sadly mistaken, and that's a claim that's not really grounded in. In fact, we've seen 10 states who, that passed laws to create databases to track officer misconduct, disciplinary actions, and decertifications, with some states requiring public access to those records. Scores of municipalities debated and revised use of force policy, mandating officers to provide emergency medical aid to suspects, banning the use of chokeholds and restricting the use of deadly force against suspects fle fleeing on, on foot or in vehicles. 
Some cities like San Francisco launched crisis response teams to deal with mental health emergencies rather than deploy armed cops. Um, as one might have anticipated, such changes have roughly mirrored the electoral map of red and blue states that we've become accustomed to discussing in mainstream um, political debate. Uh, what we've seen is deep south and upper Great Plains states largely failing to enact any substantive statewide legislation and the most progressive policy movement happening in the oceanic coastal states and most populous regions of the country. Overall, however, reform has not materialized in the manner that many assumed would follow such a massive outpouring of outrage and concern over George Floyd's death. Progress in defunding and dismantling police departments, a signature demand of radical and abolitionist elements of Black Lives Matter, has been largely confined to a few jurisdictions. At least 12 major cities like Austin and Los Angeles pledged to reduce police budgets and invest in violence prevention, job creation, housing, and other programs. Still in other places like Minneapolis, which was the epicenter of the George Floyd protest, a veto-proof city council majority in favor of dismantling the police department unraveled by the end of the summer of 2020. And that same uh, city council ultimately voted to spend 6.4 million on officer recruitment. In the midst of international protests over the police murder of George Floyd in 2020, those of us on the left who have been consistently skeptical of Black Lives Matter and the problems of identitarianism all faced a torrent of gloating criticism and derision. For many liberals and socialists, the George Floyd protest seems to fly in the face of our criticisms of racial politics as a political dead end. Some of us, like Toure Reed and myself, were called out by name and dismissed in social media threads and podcasts as irrelevant in the wake of the, the rebellions. Others face reluctance from magazine editors to publish our work for fear of backlash. And of course, there was no act of contrition or acknowledgement of the integrity of our criticisms from the naysayers, uh, our colleagues, publishers, and even close friends, even after the owl of Minerva had spread its wings and the second wave of Black Lives Matter did not deliver the kinds of concrete changes that so many had hoped for. Instead, BLM's rebirth proved to be a boon for the corporate bosses who now use blackwashing campaigns to insulate themselves from essential workers who demanded protective equipment and better wages during the early months of the coronavirus pandemic. And as we had argued forcefully in the early days of the protests, the real beneficiaries uh, would be the neoliberal politicians who reinvented themselves as social justice warriors, riding the wave of protests, um, as well as activists turned celebrities who, who rode the wave of the great awakening into the limelight and in some cases into a higher tax bracket. So I've argued consistently in a number of different places that Black Lives Matter is essentially the latest permutation of racial liberalism, proposing a set of relatively bourgeois strategies and solutions for addressing what is in fact a structurally determined conflict between police and surplus population. In saying that, I'll just to pause quickly, I actually think that the, the liberalism is not a bad thing. It just doesn't go far enough, right? And also produces its own um, own tensions that we're going to try to talk about here. So during the, the 2020 protests, um, the politics of Black Lives Matter, of course, seemed much more militant and stood in sharp contrast to the pro-policing, authoritarian uh, posturing and hubris of the Trump administration. The core premise that Black Lives Matter activists had been pushing for some time, that Black civilians were unjustly over-policed and deserved equal protection uh, as guaranteed under the Constitution, momentarily achieved majority national support. Through slogans like the new Jim Crow and Black Lives Matter, the problem of expansive carceral power uh, has been codified as a uniquely Black predicament. But police violence is not meted out against the Black population en masse, but trained against the most dispossessed segments of the working class across metropolitan, small town, and rural geographies. As I pointed out before, uh, it is crucial that we examine the, the political contradictions and limits of contemporary anti-policing struggles and explore what directions left politics might take now that Black Lives Matter has pressed the interconnected problems of police power, an outsized carceral infrastructure, 
structural unemployment, and durable inequality into public debate. So at the heart of my analysis is the view that broad popular majorities are necessary to roll back carceral power and eliminate poverty and dispossession. Indeed, when have major progressive political changes been achieved in American life without building popular and legislative majorities? Black Lives Matter protests have compelled many Americans to rethink the role of police and consider new means of achieving public safety and greater equality. The liberalness of the racial frame, however, leads back towards reformist politics and ethnic brokering, and as such undermines the progressive to revolutionary aspirations of many activists and citizens who have, who have crowded under the Black Lives Matter banner and who uh, sincerely desire an end to mass incarceration and fatal police civilian encounters. If there is an anti-capitalist or even downwardly redistributive politics expressed in different elements of um, this movement, it has been drowned out in a flood of rhetoric in recent times, in the last year or so, a flood of rhetoric around black wealth creation, fetishism and nostalgia for Jim Crow entrepreneurship, corporate diversity initiatives, disparities discourse, and a reparations demand that has primarily served as a Potemkin housing or Potemkin village for neoliberal black politics, rather than some political demand with real traction. None of these political tendencies addresses the fundamental problem underlying mass incarceration, and that is the broad national turn away from welfare and towards domestic warfare against the poor as a means of dealing with the problems of a post-industrial uh, economy. Instead, the singular focus on race and the imprecision of institutional racism as a framing favored by some activists deprioritizes and obscures the predicament of the most submerged and dispossessed elements of the black population, even as it calls for us to focus in on these problems. So this exceptionalist view, one that see, treats this as a particularly uh, particular predicament of, of, uh, of blacks in general, has isolated the plight of the most criminalized black poor from millions of other Americans who face routine surveillance, arrest, and carceral regulation. So a dogged focus on anti-racism cannot explain the problem before us, and at times can be counterproductive to building the kind of broad popular coalitions capable of reversing the carceral expansion, coalitions that have yet to materialize beyond the most liberal and enlightened reaches of the country. So in concert with other critical works on policing and, and prisons, and I can talk more about these if necessary in the, in the question and answer, what I've tried to do is explore the ways carceral power is deeply implicated in the reproduction of uh, post-industrial, maybe more discrete post-manufacturing um, capitalist economy. Far from being an extension of slavery or even Jim Crow, the punitive turn in American society and resulting carceral buildup were rooted in Cold War era developments, namely the radical transformation of American cities after World War II through suburbanization, uh, capital intensification and manufacturing, and the retreat from, social, from New Deal social democracy. Within this emerging uh, landscape, black and brown inner city poor assume the role of a miner's canary of sorts suffering through the violence of labor force contraction and joblessness before other segments of the working class in factory towns and the country's industrial interior would feel the full effects. During the urban riots of the late 60s, law and order rhetoric demonized the inner city poor who were allegedly at fault for the deteriorating conditions in some American cities and whose continued dependence on state support was seen as a drag and unfair tax burden on the rapidly expanding and mostly white middle class. Anti-black and anti-urban moral panic helped to drive the carceral buildup, but this political turn would not have been possible without the support of some black and brown publics in many cities who were desperately seeking solutions to rising crime, nuisance behavior, and declining neighborhood life that accompanied the heroin crisis of the 1970s and the crack cocaine crisis of the 80s and early 90s. The stony ground of conjuncture that produced the carceral expansion should once again underscore the importance of building majority support for contemporary struggles. 
especially at the local and state level where carceral infrastructure was built. Likewise, it should provide a strong tonic against any essentialist understandings of political constituency that conflate uh, corporeal identity with political interests and felt needs. Those two are not the same, even though we use them uh, as synonyms in some public debate. Many of the police killings that have become flashpoints for political mobilization have revealed the ways that contemporary modes of stress policing are connected to local urban accumulation regimes, largely predicated on the so-called uh, fire sector, that's finance, insurance, and real estate, as well as the tourism and entertainment industries that are so vital to uh, many contemporary local economies. During the late 80s and 90s, stress policing served as an essential beachhead of urban revanchist politics in cities like New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Big city governing coalitions increasingly targeted open air drug markets, homeless encampments, gang activity, quality of life crimes like graffiti, public intoxication, loitering, and permit violations to clear, clear the ground for renewed economic development and real estate valuation, to boost the, tarn the tarnished reputation of urban living, and to lure the middle class and wealthy back to the city as visitors and residents. The popularity of broken windows policing as a legitimate strategy took off at the same time national politicians began to dismantle the social safety net which I should say uh, was already paltry um, by global civilized standards. The black and brown poor faced ever pervasive violence, both in terms of the very visible militarized face of municipal and state police, but also the less acknowledged violence in the form of uh, hardship, harm and death due to lack of health insurance, access to quality care, uh, poverty and hunger, disproportionate exposure to environmental hazards, systemic denial of education and legitimate uh, employment opportunities, predation by uh, payday loan centers, price gouging by appliance rental companies and convenience stores, and regular disrespect from authority figures and dishonor within national political discourse. So in a lot of my work, what I've tried to do is criticize the underclass uh, mythology that has animated so much anti-welfare and pro-policing policy making from the 60s through the Obama and Trump years. The underclass myth is pernicious and it's also promiscuous. At one time associated primarily with the black inner city poor, this characterization of the poor is self-sabotaging and unassimilable has been used more broadly to blame the unemployed and unemployable across the country for their plight. Black Lives Matter forces have been steadfast in challenging the demonization of victims of police violence. This is a common thing we see from the fraternal order and other pro-policing forces is to, you know, to, to trash the, the, the dead victim. But at times, this strategy um, of suppressing whatever information there was about the, the victims has repressed publicity about the kinds of survival crimes so many have turned to amid mass obsolescence and declining real wages. What remains before us a decade after a decade of popular mobilizations is effective political organizing that might slowly rid American popular consciousness of the falsehood that criminalized forms of work. And by that, I mean prostitution, theft, carjacking, fencing, drug dealing, and so forth are somehow more ominous and deserving of punishment than tax evasion, insider trading, embezzlement, money laundering, and other white collar crimes, which uh, we could argue create greater social harm in terms of scale. Millions of Americans abhor the idea that any citizen might be racially targeted and subjected to abuse by police, and they should, but these same legions are not uh, as unnerved and ready to take to the streets over the reality that so many citizens in central cities, but also in suburbs, small towns and rural areas are locked out of traditional paths to gainful employment, education and social mobility. Any measure that will reduce the levels of police violence against civilians and reverse the decades of damage and suffering wrought by mass incarceration should be supported. <clears throat> 
dismissing these policies as reformists, which I hear sometimes from uh, some of my, my folks on the left, may confer an air of militancy for those hoping to build their brand in academia and the online echo chambers of the left. But such posturing is actually noxious, selfish, and tone deaf to the real suffering experienced by millions of Americans still caught in the carceral dragnet. Let me say a little bit about abolition um, and some of the limitations of it in relation to, to this broader argument. So the abolitionist belief that uh, we might achieve public safety through spontaneous and decentralized forms of society flourished during the summer of 2020. We caught a glimpse of this particular uh, anarcho-liberal utopia at the local scale and I would argue it was disastrous. And I think many people on, on the line would agree with me. In Seattle, activists took over six square blocks of the Capitol Hill neighborhood east of downtown, which encompassed both the East Precinct Police Headquarters and Cal Anderson Park. Originally, this area was renamed the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, but was subsequently renamed uh, the Capitol Hill Occupied Protest, which I'll refer to by the acronym CHOP. And it was deemed a police-free zone. So throughout the summer of uh, 2020, CHOP served as the center of radical democratic experimentation, live music, popular art and creativity, cooperative economics, mutual aid, uh, teach-ins, and recurring protests. CHOP rehearsed familiar social ideals and aesthetics of anti-globalization movement from the, the late 90s, as well as the Occupy Wall Street demonstrations. But like those events, it also reflected the limitations of new left descendant countercultural politics. At best, CHOP, like its predecessors, served as a demonstration city of sorts, a momentary space where participants were able to dream and think together and find rapture in speaking truth to power. The utopic view of the zone as standing outside the carceral regime as some sort of no-cop co-op, however, was a myth from the very beginning. Despite the allusions to autonomy, from its inception, CHOP always existed at the discretion of constituted power. A concession of the city leads to the protest and a liberal strategy of control through managed retreat. Likewise, the short life of the zone is a reminder that social justice, if it's to have any meaningful and universal character for citizens, needs to be legislated, not dramatized and acted out outside of political life. Finally, even as an experiment in cop-free society, CHOP ultimately failed and descended into lawlessness. The zone was plagued by a spate of violent crimes, including four shootings that resulted in two deaths and multiple reports of rape, assault, and robbery. And while some activists celebrated the banishment of police from the area, CHOP played host to equally volatile and heavily armed bands of left watchmen, right-wing militia and alt-right groups, as well as, as well as private security hired by local businesses during the occupation. Right-wing pundits seized upon the developments uh, in that particular part of the city to criticize Seattle's center-left political leadership and to impugn Black Lives Matter. But there was also organic opposition to the occupation from Seattle residents. As CHOP began to see more and more uh, violence, there was mounting public pressure from uh, tech workers and other more affluent residents in the area who demanded the restoration of uh, police control. Now, I wanna be clear, more policing and punishment provided a cheap solution to the problem of rising crime beginning in the late 60s, but it was always an immoral and socially disastrous solution. So while more policing and punishment is clearly not the answer. Neither is this countercultural response, which amounts essentially to uh, DIY policing ill suited to achieving public safety in large and complex uh, urban regions. Even worse, it amounts to a head in the sand dynamic where we can pretend crime and violence are not real issues or somehow that they will magically disappear whenever police disappear. Given that neoliberal statecraft has been the only game in town, and many activists have even repudiated the social democracy of middle 20th century American life as hopelessly racist and outmoded, uh, 
Some can only imagine the state and institutional governance as mechanisms of state violence and capitalist class interests. This, however, is a ahistorical perspective. Uh, I would argue it's unsophisticated and it's politically fatalistic. Under democratic and popular control, state power has been fundamental to working class progress across historical time and national context. And state power remains necessary for transitioning from mass incarceration to a more socially just order. A transition that will necessarily involve consecrating popular and working class interests into core governing institutions. No society emerges fully formed and devoid of the vestiges of custom, folklore, ruling ideas, myths, latent social conflicts, and hierarchies of class position, expertise, and authority that preceded it. As the corporate response to the pol police murder of George Floyd clearly illustrated, the capitalist class will continue to embrace a version of liberal anti-racism and even anti-policing measures that enhance their power and secure the conditions for perpetual compound growth. Through the summer of 2020, Black Lives Matter was good for business, whether the Hollywood film industry, uh, apparel manufacturers like Nike who embrace racial justice on the one hand, even as they exploited sweatshop labor oceans away, manufacturers of body cams and shot locators, and e-commerce giants who embraced Black Lives Matter so that they could quell worker rebellion in their own warehouses and virtue signal their way into larger market shares. Whatever reforms we might hope to achieve will have to be defended through continued political struggle against powerful classes who rely heavily on police to secure their interests. Although it represents the leading edge of an anti-carceral politics, abolitionism is limited by anarcho-liberal assertions and equally by the lack of critical perspective on the state and the, the path uh, of left, that left political transition might actually take. The very use of the term abolition by anti-carceral activists has generated considerable trepidation and confusion. Clearly activists who uh, identify as abolitionists want to align with the most progressive currents of 19th century anti-slavery abolitionists. Likewise, within the context of mass incarceration, the term abolitionist demarcates a more revolutionary political project than various technocratic and liberal responses to the problems of policing in prisons. Contemporary abolitionists want us to imagine a world without pervasive violence, militarized pr police, and warehouses for the criminalized poor. They want us to think creatively about how we might achieve public safety, eliminate material need, create more freedom and self-determination for the greatest number. On all of these matters of, of revolutionary left politics and radical imagination, I'm in agreement with them. The choice of the term abolition, however, in reference to policing has served as a badge of courage and radical commitment in activist circles, but clearly does not resonate among the broader population in the same ways. Equally concerning, the criticism of state violence and policing proffered by some drifts towards unhelpful utopian thinking and seems to assume that we can somehow separate force from politics. What I'll argue in the, the remaining part of this talk is that force is an inseparable part of modern political life. Just forms of social order require coercion and force, understood here as the capacity to uphold and execute the law, the ability to arbitrate disputes within the citizenry, and ultimately to defend the just order from saboteurs, opponents, and those who might seek to overturn it. Anti-slavery abolitionists did not seek to abolish the state, but rather to abolish the institution of slavery. And in order to secure that good, state force was essential. The abolition, uh, ultimate abolition of African chattel slavery in the United States requ required the Union Army's victory over Confederate troops and an end to the plantocracy of the Southern states. Likewise, the reconstruction period after the war, uh, during the reconstruction period after the war, federal occupation of the South was the only thing, military occupation, was the only thing standing between meaningful black freedom, understood as the right to property, the franchise and self-governance, and the reimposition of merchant landlord uh, 
class power. State force and coercion were instrumental as well during the second reconstruction, which commenced after the Supreme Court's 1954 Brown decision overturned the legal precedent of Jim Crow segregation. At critical junctures during the process of desegregation, the National Guard, federal marshals, and even the Army's uh, Air Foreign, Air, Airborne Infantry Division were mobilized to secure basic citizenship rights for Black Southerners. The moral force of civil disobedience as carried out by SCLC and other civil rights organizations was essential in shifting public opinion and legislative action, but it was also uh, often part of a sequential strategy to bring the Ju Department of Justice to town. State force, that is, was necessary to pry open the whites-only schoolhouse door and the Jim Crow ballot box. The implications of these historical facts are too often lost on, con on a contemporary left and on some Black Lives Matter forces who can only think of police power in terms of repression. So instead of uh, abolition as I've, I've uh, as we've come to know it, I think we need abolition of a different sort, not the dismantling of police departments and complete closure of prisons, but the abolition of the conditions police have been charged with managing over the last half century uh, in the midst of welfare state devolution and privatization. In a widely uh, circulated editorial during the George Floyd protest, abolitionist uh, Miriam Kaba said, quote, whether you wanna get rid of the police or simply to make them less violent, here's an immediate demand we can all make. Cut the number of police in half and cut their budget in half. Fewer officers, she continues, would equal fewer opportunities for them to brutalize and kill people. With the funds recuperated from police budgets, Kaba rightly calls for increasing spending on better jobs, health care, and housing, all of which would provide immediate relief to many in need. And she touts restorative justice uh, as a more progressive alternative to simply locking up offenders. Such calls to cut police budgets and implement restorative justice, however, I would argue, are leftist in form, but right in substance. Such demands follow the same mark of privatization as defined the transformation of the public sector in er other areas, such as public housing, education, the postal service, and infrastructure development for decades now. The result is always the same, break the power of unionized public workers, weaken the capacity of the state to address broad social problems and diminish public expectations that the state should address those social problems. And in turn, empower and enrich foundations, nonprofit organizations, entrepreneurs, assorted freelance hustlers, and nonprofit corporations to provide boutique services that will never meet the real demands of the public. The fact that the right wing lobby organization, uh, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, has jumped on the defund and restorative justice bandwagon should give pause to left anti-policing forces who prioritize these demands without thinking carefully about the actual relationship between police unions and violence and the implications for public sector workers more broadly. The virtue of restorative justice is that it seeks to repair all parties involved in a criminal act. The victim's psychological, metal, medical, financial, and other needs are prioritized. Yet the perpetrator is also viewed in their totality, not merely reduced to the crime they committed, but rather as someone deserving of support, repair, and real rehabilitation as well. Although the subject warrants a much longer dedicated uh, discussion, restorative justice has the potential to be scaled upwards um, as a normalized facet within the US criminal justice system. And some local courts have already incorporated restorative justice into sentencing processes, especially in the realm of juvenile justice. In its current foundation friendly form, however, this approach is unproven. In fact, just as the summer of 2020 protests began to lose momentum, it was revealed that a well-known Chicago activist who underwent an accountability process with Kappa after he was found guilty of rape had assaulted other persons even after the completion of that process. Perhaps this case is a terrible outlier. We wanna be conscious of that. 
But it would seem that this particular offender, a person immersed in Black Lives Matter activist subculture, would be most likely to experience transformation and benefit from a process overseen by his peers. Even if we condemn the ineffectiveness and brutality of prisons as a means of rehabilitating criminal offenders, why should we believe that restorative justice and not prison time is more effect a more effective means of ensuring public safety in light of cases like this one? Further, if a person who commits rape violates what is a society-wide law, should he be able to opt out of the justice system? A move that would enrage most uh, of us as activists if it was afforded to wealthy offenders. Most of us want our loved ones who have been accused of a crime to be afforded a second chance. Most of us want to see the life of the victim and the offender restored in ways that are possible, uh, that are impossible in a contemporary order. But what responsibility do we have to the broader communities and society we are a part of, especially when the consequences are not limited to the victim and the offender? This particular Chicago case involved a respected and celebrated activist and is a reminder that restorative justice is still a niche alternative not available to all offenders. Certainly not the thousands of similarly situated sex offenders who lack the same network connections and social standing of a beloved activist. Perhaps inadvertently, demands to defund and right-size police departments and fund both restorative justice and ceasefire type conflict mediation approaches will accelerate the turn towards uh, capital intensive policing already in motion. By capital intensive policing, I'm referring to the turn towards big data mining, automated and robotic technologies and other um, methods that, repute, that reduce uh, the need for human labor. Capital intensive policing will not uh, solve the fundamental problem that contemporary policing was engineered to address, uh, which is the management of surplus population. Without elimin eliminating the very impetus for modern policing, which is the defense of capitalist interests, we will inevitably reproduce the same order, but with a more tolerable veneer. One where the open social conflicts are forced out of view and more secure segments can once again go back to their Zoom meetings, commutes, vacations and shopping, social media posting and secure neighborhood life. The demand to defund police departments and reroute public monies towards social spending, particularly for black and brown working class youth, has revived much needed public discussion about redistributive politics and spending priorities. This demand, however, does not go far enough, often not even venturing beyond the familiar forms of social assi assistance and job training that many black activists criticized as inadequate during the Great Society period. Moreover, the demand to defund police departments is an errant call for redistribution, focusing on outsized police budgets while neglecting the broader and much more lucrative urban public wealth transfers that are made under the pretense of private economic development. Police budgets in many cities pale in comparison to the sum total of tax breaks, land grants, infrastructure improvements, public contracts and other giveaways that are routinely doled out to corporations and developers with little if any public outrage or pushback. We need a more expansive criticism of how public resources are allocated and distributed in cities, one that approaches the process of urban capital accumulation regimes in total. Otherwise, we set up a rather distracting focus on police budgets, target, targeting an ancillary aspect of the actual broader growth and accumulation regimes that reproduce tremendous wealth and also tremendous deprivation. Abolishing the inequalities policing was charged with managing might begin with public works that are addressed uh, to structural unemployment while also providing more expansive public goods. So let me talk a little bit about how this, this might work by way of uh, conclusion. Metropolitan public works programs might mobili be mobilized to um, to address unemployment and improve uh, widely used amenities like public transportation, uh, raising working conditions and wage floors in historically devalued sectors like care work, as well as to advance the proliferation and use of green technologies. <clears throat> 
Together, these and other broad public works pro projects would not only eliminate uh, unemployment and the last resort of dangerous criminal employment for many citizens, but such initiatives would simultaneously create effective demand and flood long neg neglected neighborhoods with investment and economic development. Moreover, such public works initiatives could enhance the overall quality of urban living and if implemented under democratic and neighborhood control, deepen citizen investment and oversight in urban planning and orient, reorient the sense of political possibility at the level of everyday life. The Depression Era Works Progress Administration and Civilian Conservation Corps uh, both serve as important historical precedents, projects that not only cured unemployment, but were also organized around use value, producing public goods such as parks, post offices, schools, and other public build buildings, but also a more literate population, public murals, travel guides, roads, and bridges. Many of these things are still cherished and enjoyed nearly a century later. Yet while these legendary public works um, projects provide inspiration, a revi revitalized vision of public works might surpass those in terms of popular democratic control and out of necessity should be tailored to new conditions and the specific challenges and place-based needs in a world overrun by privatization. The enhancement of genuine public works would dramatically improve daily life for wide swaths of the public, especially those populations and spheres of activity that have been neglected and devalued because they do not serve um, the profit motive. I think all of these things, um, rerouting public funds, developing public works projects that address uh, specific needs within cities, all of these things are possible through, uh, through politics and through the protracted work that goes along with, with, um, with political uh, life. And I really hope that, you know, in the, in the time we have remaining, we can do some of that heavy lifting and do some of the collective work that's necessary to create a more just uh, society. All right, so I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that talk. There's a lot there. Uh, I think uh, one of the, the questions that I wanna start off with is I really appreciate the uh, critique of the way uh, in which maybe some of the uh, language of Black Lives Matter severs off potential coalition building activity. I'm just wondering what you would say to individuals or critics that say there is a need to focus on the particular uh, issues that are affecting Black people disproportionately as a way of making sure that uh, that gets addressed uh, sort of as we push against uh, sort of mass incarceration. I mean, some people would say absent that focus on the disparity, you would not get to uh, uh, an ideal future or a future in which that disparity no longer exists. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or, or responses to that criticism. Yes, yeah, so I don't I don't have a problem with uh, the focus on um, on actual racist, you know, acts, right? I mean, I've I participated um, you know, in various protests, demonstrations that deal, you know, in, in with situations where it's very clear, right, that a person was was singled out, targeted um, in ways that were discriminatory, right? So I, I don't I don't see if, if, if you live in a place and then there's the other thing is in certain places, certain parts of the country. And I said this to some students recently, um, there's a way that the Black Lives Matter uh, slogan is perfect for for the context right so in a place like chicago if you look at um the the record of police killings during black lives La black Lives matters first wave right so if you go back to like around i think 2008 to to 2013 um of all the police shootings in the city of chicago 72 percent of those were of black people within the city Right. So there's no, you know, there's no getting around that. Right. That is the dynamic in this particular place. When we get beyond 
the the uh, the city of Chicago, when we're in other kinds of jurisdictions, if we're in the, the Great Plains states where per capita some of the highest incidents of police killings happen, happen right, places where there aren't very, uh, very many black people, um, there's a different set of, of, um, of dynamics at play which have to be addressed with, with other kinds of, of approaches and analysis. And so um, there's a way it really works well and it works well with certain cases. And there's a way that we circulate and bring attention to certain cases because they adhere to that, that, that narrative, right? Um, but again, you know, as I said this to students as well, if we stop police killings of black people tomorrow, right, if that was a possibility, the U.S. would still far outpace all other uh, countries of similar wealth in terms of fatal police encounters with civilians, right? And so I think there's, it's not an either or thing, right? Again, in certain contexts, you know, Black Lives Matter hits the mark, right? Harassment, discrimination is clear um, in, in some, some jurisdictions. But when we look at the national numbers, there's a different story. And if we're trying to achieve um, broad change, why wouldn't we? You know, what's to be lost from, from mobilizing in ways that are flexible and that can address different conditions in, in different parts of the country? Oh, thank you. Uh, a question from the chat. Uh, ben is asking if you could uh, clarify or expand on the concept of uh, blackwashing that you mentioned at the, at the beginning of your talk. What is it? And uh, I guess, what, what do you mean by that? Yes, yeah, so if we, if, to me, it's analogous to uh, greenwashing, right? Your, people might remember, you know, even back in the 1990s, um, companies like Starbucks and others began using earth-toned packaging um, as well as different kinds of campaigns about how they treated the towns and villages and farming communities that sourced their, their uh, coffee beans. They wanted to, to respond to environmental, real environmental concerns, right? Um, but in a way which that was, that had less to do with dealing with inequality in those places and exploitation of farmers in other parts of the world and instead set their own terms right so they were essentially greenwashing when it came to the, the earth tone cups i use that term blackwashing in the aftermath of the george floyd protest to refer to the way corporations responded right by various campaigns that presented them as in alignment with the interests of black activists, um, but only in a superficial way, right? No different from earth tone, you know, packaging, right? You know, one, maybe the perfect example is the NFL, right? Which, which has not only faced a recent lawsuit about the hiring of black coaches, but it only recently changed um, a different threshold for evaluating uh, head trauma to black players versus white players, right? So. They've only recently made certain kinds of changes. They've done certain things like use, you know, the slogan in racism and the end zone. But, you know, that's, again, superficial, right? It doesn't necessarily deal with um, some of the deeper problems in the society. And in many cases, um, I mean, it, it reveals itself to be especially superficial, right? There was at least one meme circulating online that showed the, the uh, Kansas City football stadium with in racism and then chiefs right alongside each other, right in the end zone. So I think, um, yeah, when I use the term blackwashing, it's about people who are signaling that they are in alignment with Black Lives Matter, even as they're unwilling to make uh, substantial commitments or even antagonistic in some ways to what should be a racial justice uh, position. All right. Uh Thank you. Uh, another question uh, about, uh, I guess, kind of language, and I was wondering if you could flesh out uh, why you see, uh, in some ways it's similar to the first question, uh, why you see maybe the uh, uh, the use of the analogy of the new Jim Crow as potentially problematic or not getting us to where we need to go. Because, I mean, I think some people would say, look, this book has done more than anything else to sort of get this issue sort of out to the American public. and you know, maybe it's not accurate historically, but 
uh, sort of been drawing attention to the issue, uh, maybe it's uh, something that we should be willing to live with. I just wonder what your response to that would be. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, so uh, I've assigned it. Um, I've had discussions with people about it. I am not um, somebody who thinks people shouldn't read it, right? Because because I don't agree with some of the some of the claims. Um, one thing I will say about it, right? I mean, the, the things that it gets right, you know, and and she was able to to alert us and alert many people to the problem of um, felon disenfranchisement, right? What happens to people after they've been uh, convicted of a crime after they served time, and in a way, her work helped to popularize, you know, an, an argument, an analysis that had been circulated among uh, activists and academics. And I think that's useful, right? That may be the place where it comes closest to resembling, um, you know, the second-class citizenship of of the uh, the Jim Crow era. At the same time, though, it, it like the film Thirteenth, uh, right? Ava DuVernay's film. It really, you know, both of those have good things in them, right? I mean, the, the Ava DuVernay film does a great job when they're talking about ALEC and these other uh, organizations and their role in, in the carceral expansion. So I think that stuff is good. But the way they set up this, this argument that nothing has changed or that there's this unbroken continuity um, between slavery and Jim Crow and the present um, is just bad, right? It just doesn't necessarily help us. There's a way in which it actually distracts us from more immediate sources of our current um, predicament, right? And so in the case of, of the 13th Amendment, we can certainly say that it had a role to play in uh, convict leasing, apprenticeship, and other things that were used to, um, to institutionalize Black people, to compel Black labor during the, the reconstruction period and its aftermath. So there's this is definitely that part. But for the most part, the American prison population remains majority white up until the eve of, of uh, Ronald Reagan's election as president in 1980, right? It's still, I think, 60% white at that point. So what does the 13th Amendment have to do with that? It's really after you know, um, the 1980 election of Reagan. And with a lot of the things that I've already talked about, like the dismantling of the welfare state, the uh, process of urban revanchism in cities, um, the declaration of another war on drugs that disproportionately affects um, black and brown men in cities. It's really then that we begin to see this complete transformation of the uh, demography of American prisons but yet, you know, 13th kind of takes us all the way back to the 19th century when it's not necessarily helpful. And it actually it actually does a lot of damage to our understanding of, of what happened. The other thing I would say about the new Jim Crow, and, and in this case, I'm more closely aligned with people like Loic Quant when he talks about the difference between the ghetto and the hyper ghetto or between, um, you know, when he talks about hyper incarceration. We really need to be clear about which segments of the black population are the most likely to feel the brunt of uh, carceral power and policing, right? It's not, it's not everybody, right? It's actually certain zip codes, certain neighborhoods that are the most heavily policed. Um, and I think that gets lost when we refer to the analogy of Jim Crow, right? So truly under Jim Crow, it didn't matter. If you were a black person who uh, had an advanced graduate degree, if you were someone who owned your own store, you could be discriminated against, you could be mistreated, you were not allowed to participate uh, as a full citizen in terms of voting or sitting on a jury trial. And so everybody was subjected to that. But what we're looking at now is very different, right? Surely, you know, people are discriminated against, right? There's discriminatory patterns in terms of Black people being stopped in general by cops, you know, with traffic stops. We know that. But in terms of who is uh, most likely to be uh, tried, convicted, and incarcerated, and um, managed even post-incarceration, those are the most dispossessed segments of the population, like right? the poorest of the Black population. And I think we need to be clear about that. And when we, when we take that perspective, then it's easier to have the conversation, which is something that Michelle Alexander couldn't do when she's confronted with it,
um, it's easier to have the conversation about the similarities between somebody who is a white person who gets convicted of uh, selling opioids in Southern Arkansas, right? And a black person in Chicago who is convicted for some other crime, right? There's a way in which their lives are, are more similar than we would we would be, be led to believe using the framework that we get from Michelle Alexander, who argues outright that whites who were arrested during the drug war were uh, collateral damage, right? So they, they almost, they become second class citizens within the second class citizen narrative that she sets up. All right, uh, thank you for uh, that answer. We have another question from the chat, kind of referencing the uh, earlier question, uh, who was asking, in a movement like Black Lives Matter, is there any way to change the blackwashing or prevent it from happening again? Or is this something that's sort of part of this particular type of uh, social movement or maybe even social media movement? Yeah, I mean, I think the problem lies in the, again, the liberal dimension of Black Lives Matter, right? The slogan itself, um, the elasticity of the slogan, right? It can be adapted to all sorts of different positions. I think if we take more concrete uh, stances on particular policies, like demanding, you know, when people when people within um, different protests, you know, as it migrated from one city to another in the first wave of Black Lives Matter, when people demanded specific things like let's reduce the size of a police budget, let's reroute money towards, um, you know, youth programs and job training and other things, you're on a different terrain, right? You end up have you end up finding out clearly which people are on your side, right? And who's going to be willing to support those kinds of real policy solutions. So you move away from like this broad elastic slogan that anybody can adapt to whatever purposes. So I think that's where the difference lies, right? And that's where, you know, as I ended up the 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 talk tonight, um, a focus on public works sets up a different kind of conversation. It's not one that can be so easily co-opted. I mean, perhaps, but maybe that would be a good thing if there's in, in infusions of money to, <laughs> to try to deal with with uh, with employment through publicly funded and publicly managed uh, you know programs. But I just think that um, yeah, I mean, at the level of of high flying and abstract slogans, it's easy for them to be be uh, appropriated. But you know, this is an issue of convergence, right? I mean, the the, the ideology from the very beginning. Is fairly liberal, right? It's 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 pitched within the context of equal protection, right? We deserve the same things. Our lives should matter in the same ways under the Constitution as it's established, which is a very different kind of. You you end up in the same place, I guess. We want it, one way to think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really helpful. I guess one follow up question I would have is: Do you think then that uh, this is more of an issue of a difference in fundamental underlying ideology or in a difference of tactics. Because if it was just tactics, you could say, well, then maybe we could reorganize structurally. But if, if the problem is that most people that have sort of tweeted out in support or, or sort of uh, express outrage against police violence is really more along this liberal line, is that sort of a problem of a different sort in terms of most people may not actually be on the side that you're advocating? I'm just wondering what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, I like to approach this as as process, right? That this is how politics works, you know. Um, you know, you can't have perfect slogans, perfect conditions. And, you know, the, the power of Black Lives Matter, as I tried to sketch out at the very beginning, has been this, this way of mobilizing and crystallizing a lot of different sentiments, right, that people are, are witnessing. Um, I mean, I think that one of the beauties of it, it actually unites um, a lot of the the insecurity, a lot of the uh, precariousness that many people feel. Uh, just talking about the black population um, in the wake of various waves of neoliberalization, right, that have done damage to blacks who are public sector workers, blacks who were relying upon the public school system in some ways to educate their children, now thrown into the volatility of, of charter schools and all sorts of other transformations. Um, black people who watched the, their, their neighborhoods and environments deteriorate, you know, um, 
in 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 the same period who've also faced pressure of, of gentrification in other other places and so all of those things together i mean i think is sort of ripe for a slogan like black lives matter right where people are feeling more more insecure and and um you know threatened than ever before right and so it makes sense in that in that moment but i do think that my role as an intellectual and i think the role of, of us as activists and citizens is to really begin to push well what is it you know what's at the root of it it's not old school racism alone but all of these other processes that have been set in motion and unleashed in complicated ways right oftentimes supported by by blacks who are in power right and so again the the, the same kind of politics won't work um or at least it won't reveal to us uh, exactly what's what's happening in front of us uh thank you uh another question from the chat from emily uh in response to the case of the chicago activist do you think that combating other social ills like misogyny homophobia ableism etc are necessary in the struggle for an anti-racist society yeah i mean absolutely right I, I don't i don't uh yeah i guess there's there's a way in which i'm trying to in this in this talk lay out a particular criticism it doesn't preclude or or uh cut out other sorts of of possibilities um even in the case of the the activists that i brought up um, the point in bringing it up wasn't to to impugn the activists or even to uh, suggest that this isn't a better way to think about about um, you know how do we how do we respond to you know how do we how do we discipline or respond to people who have done done wrong right you know what's the what's the proper response so I like the way that it opens up a different um, space for us to imagine. But I don't, I don't necessarily think it's adequate, right? I don't think it really gets to the heart of the matter. But of course, you know, in response to the one person from the chat, uh, yeah, it's it's all of those things, right? And then some that has to be a part of what we we uh, what we do. Thank you. I have a question about uh, your discussion of abolitionism. I really appreciated the sort of critique of the way in which that can be funneled into a critique of the state, which from a left perspective is not something that uh, most leftists would want to see. Uh, however, I'm wondering that given the sort of explosion in the number of uh, sort of prisons, uh, sort of jails that have happened in the last 50 years, isn't wouldn't it seem that moving towards an ideal uh, society would actually require attacking some of those sort of at least symbols or, or concrete evidences of state power? No, absolutely, right? So, so if that wasn't clear, uh, yeah, of course. Um, the, the issue or the one I was trying to raise was more about can we move to a place where prisons, jails, policing are, are obsolete, which is a point that some, some have argued, right? Um, in my sense, thinking about history more broadly and thinking about how um, how sovereignty works, how you would expect a large city the size of Chicago or, or uh, New York City even to function, right, without some sort of, of um, you know, police presence. I'm just not, I'm just not that, that uh, idealistic to think that we can do that. Another thing, I think on the left, we have to be clear about this as well. We've only witnessed you know, um, when it comes to, we haven't only witnessed this, but what we tend to focus on is the, the ways in which the state, particularly during the 1960s, was used to repress um, popular social movements within the, within the United States, right? Um, at the same time, can we think of, can somebody think of uh, any sort of socialist society that was created and that lasted for any amount of time without police? And without a military, right? It's sort of like the difference is, you know, uh, Salvador Allende's Chile versus, you know, the Castro regime, which was able to survive multiple assassination attempts, the Bay of Pigs invasion. And so 
my point is that there's a way in which um, if you create a just form of society, right, it still has to be defended and upheld. Um, its laws have to be upheld. And how do you do that without, you know, some sort of, of uh, legitimate use of, of, uh, of violence? Yeah, no, thank, uh, that's really helpful. It's just, I think sometimes it can be difficult to conceive of attacking one form of state power while not or while simultaneously advocating for building it in, in another mm -hmm. area. And I think how to effectively do that can be uh, kind of a, a tricky a tricky thing, which kind of gets to the uh, uh, another question from the chat, which is, what do you believe is actually maybe a concrete first step towards addressing mass incarceration? Are there some forms of public works or public goods that you would advocate immediately as sort of first steps uh, in sort of improving the situation? Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of things people are already doing, right? I mean, you know, uh, there's a whole range of of real reforms that have happened. You know, just like the the fact that the the carceral system comes is built in different jurisdictions, sort of year by year. Um, we're also seeing, you know, decarceration happening in step by step, one jurisdiction to another, year by year. And so I think like, you know, things like ending money bail, um, <clears throat> fully funding public defenders offices, right? So that, it, you know, people are not, who, who can't afford to pay for counsel are not expected to just plea bargain and accept, you know, prison time or some sort of supervision um, for crimes that might not necessarily result in the same sort of punishment. I think uh, we're already seeing the push towards uh, e-carceration, which, you know, to her credit, Michelle Alexander's offered some good criticisms of, but, you know, this idea of moving more and more um, persons who've been uh, convicted into home supervision, you know, house detention type situations with electronic monitoring that's already in place, is already being used uh, in different states. It's, there's problems around that as well that we could talk about, um, but I think there's, there's all sorts of things that are already being done, it's just in a pell-mell sort of willy-nilly way, right? And it's not, you know, it depends on where you are as to whether or not you'll benefit from it. We've seen uh, liberalization of cannabis and legalization in some states, decriminalization in others. And so again, you know, in my home state of Louisiana, people are still being locked up for cannabis uh, possession with intent to distribute, right? So it just depends on where you are. Um, what your what your situation might look like, and I think a lot of those things are good, right? Sort of ending the long reign of and the long impact of the war on drugs, um, and the impacts it's had on on communities, right? It's destroyed communities, right? So we can reverse some of that. But the argument I make for public works is that it is an immediate step, right? It could be it's something that could be legislated at the local level, you know, in a place like Chicago, which operates almost like a city state when it comes to the state of Illinois. It would be possible to have a citywide public works project available to, you know, people of, of a certain age or certain uh, income. But I think, you know, it takes like political vision and also uh, work you know, like I said, protracted work to really get something like that off the ground. But I do believe there's a reason. I was asked this question yesterday in a conversation with graduate students. I do believe there's a reason why people who aren't directly impacted by uh, crime and violence, but who live in urban or metropolitan areas would have an interest in wanting to see these things work. It's because we all want to live in a place that's safer, right? And if we, if we, if we workshop or, um, you know, you do like pilot projects that can demonstrate that, you know, if you provide um, gainful employment to people, then the, the criminalized forms of work, which are employment of last resort, are dissipated in part, right? That you end up seeing more and more people able to uh, sustain themselves. And like I said, it can actually have bigger impacts on cities and transform the way that we think about cities and what our what our uh, possibilities are in cities if we resurrect and, and, and advance, you know, a different model of public works.
Uh, great, thank you. I uh, do have uh, another couple questions from the chat. I think that touched directly on this sort of looking towards the future aspect, which is, uh, so one of the problems that you're attending is the fact that mainstream, uh, that the mainstream neutralizes the strike at the root demands of social movements like the movement for black lives. Uh, so if hashtag Black Lives Matter has been unalterably mainstream at its core, could you map uh, for us your vision of what social movement or something else we need now? Yeah, that's like, that's the type of question I wouldn't really want to answer, right? It's like, like, of course, I want to see in, in the way more in the way of, of uh, anti-capitalist politics, right? That's where my, where my politics are, right? That, those are the kinds of things that I'm willing to, to fight for. Um, and I do think, you know, sincerely that many of the problems we have in this society uh, are rooted in the problems of, of, of capital accumulation as it stands at this particular moment, right? So there's, so there's that. Um, I do think that Black Lives Matter, you know, has created the potential for um, these conversations about redistribution within cities, right? And within, you know, certain jurisdictions, you know, whether it's a countywide um, situation or in a small, you know, a, a part of a, a, a region. Um, so I think that that's, that's there, right? That we, we've seen it, you know, we've seen people talking about these things in city council meetings. Um, and yeah, defund and dismantle has not, uh, you know, it hasn't materialized in the ways that people imagine, but it's it's opened up a conversation, right? And I know when I talk to students, you know, and when I'm in other kinds of settings as well, and you begin to talk in concrete terms about um, how much money is being spent in most cities to finance private sector development, students recoil at that. One, because they're not, they're not receiving that information um, on television, in their social media feeds. It's something that we're really blinded to. Um, but once they find out about like tax increment financing and all sorts of other schemes, they immediately are, are pissed off about it and they, they have a sense that something needs to be done. And so um, I think that, again, there's a way in which we might be able to connect the energy, the, uh, the excitement, um, you know, the awakening that a lot of people have experienced as a result of the George Ford protests and even earlier uh, demonstrations that can be channeled into and are being channeled into other kinds of, of real concrete struggles within within cities that deal with these these uh, these distributive problems. Oh, uh, thank you. I do have a, uh, another question in the chat here, which I think uh, maybe is related to this current form of uh, activism and maybe whether or not we should call it that, which is with the majority of advocacy of black issues being on social media with hashtag Black Lives Matter, do you think social media is doing more harm than good in terms of creating a concrete base for change? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, of course. <laughs> Anybody over the age of 40 probably says social media does more harm than good, right? Just like my grandmother hated us watching television, right? Um, I mean, the form itself, right, does a lot of damage. You know, it it thrives on oversimplification. It thrives on uh, the, our need for validation more so than our need to explore and to consider different uh, positions, you know, people who are dissimilar from us. It invites us to a particular kind of you know, orgy of uh, Schadenfreude, where we just spend our days laughing at somebody else's, you know, misadventures. And I just think that it doesn't really help us. Um, it, it it creates a lot of barriers among us. I don't know how to reverse it. You know, uh, it is addictive as a as a thing, and my, I'm included in that number. I've had moments where I'm constantly checking feeds and responding and getting embroiled in controversies. I think it I, I think it runs counter to the kind of of uh, rhythms of political life that we need, which have nothing to do with arguing with people all day on social media or looking at memes, but rather sort of settling in with people 
who we're connected to, people who live on our in our neighborhoods, people who live in our cities and our towns, people who are part of the same institutions we are part of, um, settling in with folks and figuring out not only what things we have in common um, and having long sustained conversations with each other about our needs, our desires, our dreams, um, that's a different thing, right? That leads to a really rich possibility of, of public spiritedness, very different from being on social media, right? So I just think it is destructive. Uh, and again, when it comes to race, it just really reproduces a lot of essentializing, uh, you know, just bad retrograde thinking about what race actually is, right? I mean, it allows people to really fester and stay in this place where we think that it, it is biology, right? And and you and your position is to, to valorize it and celebrate it and not interrogate um, the damage it's done in this country historically uh, and why, you know, race and racism need to be um, defeated, you know, um, in a real way. It becomes a, its own thing, it takes on a life of its own, you know, to use the, the worn out phrase on social media. Oh, thank you so much for this uh, lively discussion. I'm actually going to turn the uh, conversation back over to Dr. Muhammad for uh, maybe a final question or closing remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, one of the things that I did want to uh, help us to sort of close out is to return to, because you've opened up this conversation in such a way that has allowed us to address um, these really pressing economic and, and social issues that it's, it has a very now feeling to it. And I also think that with your reference to post-manufacturing capitalism, for me as a historian, it was very ev ev evocative of the liberal agenda following World War II, um, the decline of many union or sort of aspirations of certain unions, the left within the union movement, mm -hmm. um, suburbanization. But I'm really struck by your use of the term post-manufacturing capitalism, because I think in reference to your place, it's really important. The area that we're in in southeastern Ohio um, experienced post-industrialization 100 years ago in terms of extractive industries like coal mm. mining still exists, but um, significantly shifted. Um, and yet we know that this, this manufacturing piece, which had been the core place for the growth of the working class and labor activism, um, what, with its decline, we have seen these, these pockets of intense uh, you know, economic misery. Mm -hmm. So can you um, elaborate on your, is that a, simply a nice distinction that you're making between post-industrial um, a bit of a particular sector? Or in what, in, what is the utility of that? I, I can, it resonates with me for specific reasons, but I, I'm interested in why you use the term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I used it because, you know, we say industrial, you know, McDonald's is an is the restaurant industry is an industry, right? Um, the movie industry is an industry, right? And so the idea that we're post-industrial, it's really a shorthand for referring to um, the dramatic changes uh, within heavy manufacturing, the loss of uh, manufacturing jobs, um, and and it it's I'm I'm like everybody else searching for a a more precise term, right? So if we use post-manufacturing, it even that's not helpful, right? Because uh, in a place like Chicago, you know, you, you visit these steel mills, we're still producing, you know, in, from Gary to other parts of, of the region, we're still producing the same volume of steel. So they're still manufacturing. The difference is the loss of, of, of human labor, you know, living labor in the process. And so a lot of different uh, phrases out there. I've heard um, one phrase, I've already used hyper ghetto, you know, from ghetto to hyper ghetto, but uh, I think John Koval in a book uh, called um, The New Chicago uses the phrase um, uh, hyper, -industrial, hyper industrialism as opposed to post because it's still industry, but more capital intensive. Uh, 
industry, right? In the case of of some of these 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 old manufacturers in the city of Chicago, right? They're still still producing high volume, but just without the same uh, labor. And so, I think that's what you heard was me trying to struggle through. How do we acknowledge that they're still manufacturing? And even you know the other thing too. Even if I say, well, we've lost a, a tremendous amount of manufacturing jobs in Chicago or parts of the Midwest, manufacturing is still happening, right? Our clothing, our computers, it's just that that manufacturing has been uh, geographically uh, dispersed. And so, um, yeah, I think it's the it's trying to struggle through what, what post-industrialism reveals as a concept, but also what it conceals about the, the moment that we're in. Thank you. And, and that, that brings us to a, a significant moment, which is the, the end of our time together. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cedric Johnson. And for everyone who joined us this evening, um, you've helped to guide our searching and we're walking away with some really important questions and, and content that I think we'll continue to deliberate on. And we hope to see you uh, again soon online or face to face and wish you the very best um, as springtime approaches. Daniel, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, no, just uh, thank you for coming and uh, go buy Dr. Johnson's book. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. And, and thank to the tech team, Elise and Devin.